So I know it's already been somewhat of a long day for people, especially for those of us that have been here throughout the entire day, but this panel is undeniably second to none. Um, I'm very pleased to present this, the third panel, which is titled, What Should? And this panel will, will be discussing the policy implications and what should be the politics and policy regarding the MPT review this May. Our first speaker is Adam Mendelson. He is the managing editor of the Middle East Journal. The Middle East Journal is the leading peer-reviewed journal on, modern, on the modern Middle East. He is the co-author of America's Midlife Crisis, The Future of a Troubled Superpower. He has spoken on issues of public and foreign policy at the International Institute of Education, the German Marshall Fund, American, uh, American University, and the Middle East Institute, among other venues. He has also worked as a program coordinator at the Intercultural Management Institute, facilitating cross-cultural trainings and programs for multinational companies, agencies, and members of the military. He serves on the editorial review board of the Intercultural Management Quarterly. Um, Mr. Mendelssohn also has a Master's of Arts degree in International Affairs with concentrations in the Middle East and conflict resolution um, from American University and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Eastern Studies and Near Eastern Studies and History from Cornell. So please help me to welcome Mr. Adam Mendelssohn. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> it's really an honor to speak with such distinguished panelists with such an amazing depth and breadth of knowledge. Uh, I think the only area of knowledge that I can unquestionably best them in is UConn basketball trivia, uh, since I grew up a little north of here. Unfortunately, and perhaps amazingly, this conference isn't about that. Um, and luckily, I happen to know a little bit about the history and politics of the Middle East, too. Uh, I've been asked today to discuss the political and historical background for why states in the Middle East have pursued nuclear capabilities, uh, along with the political dimensions of the current situation in Iran and efforts to create a regional nuclear weapons-free zone. Uh, I think this is a really important context to have, uh, not only to get behind today's headlines, but also to grasp what's at stake in the May NPT Review Conference. Uh, so I'd like to sketch out first, uh, on a sort of thematic basis, uh, the political and historical reasons why states in the Middle East have sought nuclear capabilities. Uh, all this is going to be really ambitious in the time that I have, uh, so it's sort of going to be like political and historical speed dating. Uh, so I apologize for the holes that uh, there will be, uh, and I hope they can be filled in during the Q&A. So let me start. Uh, sure, I don't think I can control it. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Speak closer to it. Very close. Gotcha. Sorry about that. Uh, let me start uh, about 40 years ago, uh, June 16th, 1963. Uh, David Ben Gurion, Israel's prime minister for all but two years of its existence, resigned. Eleven days later, he traveled to the Armaments Development Authority to deliver a farewell address to its employees, who are mostly scientists and military men. He said, I do not know of any other nation whose neighbors declare that they wish to terminate it and prepare for it by all means available to them. Our science can provide us with the weapons that are needed to deter our enemies from waging war against us. Science is able to provide us with the weapon that will secure the peace. Three years ago, the Iranian newspaper Kehan ran an editorial entitled Duel with an Unloaded Gun, which read in part, it is Iran which will decide on the news and the event with which it will strike the superpowers at their weak points and their Achilles heel. Iran has great wisdom in its clip. Each bullet of wisdom prepares the ground for new opportunities and makes Iran's hands more skilled. America is now dealing with the deadly hail of Iran's wisdom. So what comes through from these quotes? There's the inviolable connection between the power of scientific nuclear knowledge and political military power in the Middle East. National sports and national science for national security, in other words. Now, to say that nuclear weapons are tied to security is not exactly a groundbreaking statement. Yet, since the end of the Cold War, and I think as we've seen in the panels today, and especially the last panel, uh, n in no other region has there been such a fear that a nuclear arms race could develop. And if I can go to the first slide here, uh, this shows a map of proliferation status in 2009 by the Carnegie Endowment. And you can notice just how many singled out states there are that are in the Middle East relative to the rest of the world. So why has this been? 
What is it about the Middle East that has exacerbated proliferation and exacerbated so much of the international community? To answer this question, uh, let's go back to the region's first proliferator of Israel. Now, this slide uh, illustrates Israel's nuclear facilities. I hope you can see that. Uh, that's also from the Carnegie Endowment. You can find that on their website. Uh, and the right-hand picture is a satellite image of its main facility of Dimona. For as long as it has existed, Israel has harbored serious existential security concerns. The country experienced multi-front wars and planned for a Mikre Hakol, or everything scenario in which it was attacked by all of the Arab states. Moreover, the memory of the Holocaust and lack of confidence in foreign powers assistance led Israeli policymakers to advocate for Israel being the ultimate guarantor of its own security, thus encouraging the development of a nuclear program as an ultimate military trump card and deterrent. And it's thought to have achieved such a capacity in the mid to late 60s. Now, the problem with proliferation, of course, is that it begets more proliferation. And in a region where countries are long on rivals and short on trust, security-driven nuclear programs of varying degrees of maturity have abounded, and many of them have been framed as a response to Israel's capabilities. So let's do a quick east-to-west review of major nuclear rivalries in the region, just to get a sense of, of what the lay of the land is a little bit. So first, and let me see if this is going to work. Uh, it does. My wife taught me how to do this. I can't claim actually <laughs> being able to figure this out myself. Uh, so first, let's start with Libya. Uh, Libya was interested in countering Israel's nuclear capability, as well as matching the programs being developed by Egypt, its neighbor and rival, and Iraq, another rival for regional leadership. Egypt, there we go, uh, was squeezed between two countries, Libya and Israel, uh, with nuclear programs, and fought four wars with Israel. Its rivalry with Iraq for a leadership role in the Arab world added to nuclear tensions, and currently its rivalry with Iran has helped to renew its nuclear activity. Moving west, uh, we should note the antagonism between Israel and Syria, Iraq, and Iran have served as a catalyst for the nuclear programs of all of these countries. Uh, Turkey has discussed nuclear development in the wake of Iran's drive. Uh, we checked Saudi Arabia and Egypt off the list, but we should add Saudi Arabia and Iran to our map here. The rivalry between the two countries has grown especially heated since the 1979 Iranian Revolution, and sadly concern about Iran's program today is, is very significant. Uh, Iraq and Iran is another to mention. Although they're closer today, Iran's nuclear program under the Shah helped to catalyze the Iraqi program, and Iraq's use of chemical weapons during the Iran-Iraq war encouraged Iran to refocus, to its then, uh, refocus upon its then fairly stagnant nuclear program. And finally, the OE's interest in nuclear program has increased along with the development of Iran's own program. So obviously, this slide wasn't made for the purposes of clarity, because you can barely see the map right now, uh, but rather to show what a mess this is and how difficult it will be to untangle this web. There's sort of a six degrees of separation kind of thing going on here. If you want to address the nuclear program of one country, it's very hard not to widen the, the map very quickly. If you want to talk about you know, Israel's security concerns and denuclearizing in Israel, then not only do we have to talk about Iran, but Iran's relationship with Hezbollah. If you talk about Hezbollah, then you have to talk about Lebanese domestic politics. If you talk about Lebanese domestic politics, then Syria gets very interested. Now you're back to Syria and Iran. So it's just quite, quite a tangled cobweb. Um, Israel's program clearly fed into this situation. Uh, yet there'll be an oversimplification to identify this as the only reason for proliferation. Long-standing rivalries, sectarian and ideological tensions, uh, drives for regional hegemony, and a lack of formal collective security guarantees or organizations fed into this insecurity and served to heighten countries' uh, desires to, exploit, to explore a nuclear program. So uh, security concerns are the first of the four main uh, reasons why countries in the region have sought nuclear programs that I'll talk about today. So let me move on to the second reason. Uh, December 23, 1960, Gamal Abdel Nasser stood before a crowd in Port Said, Egypt, one of the flashpoints of the 1956 Suez War. Nasser, the, the very embodiment, really, of Arab nationalism, proclaimed, our atom bomb is our unity and our faith in our country. They say that Israel is making an atom bomb. Our reply to this is that such talk increases Arab determination to adhere to Arab nationalism and Arab unity. We will under no circumstances permit Israel to be our superior. Now, in 2006, Nasser's countryman, the fellow Egyptian, electricity and energy minister Hassan Yunus, said regarding the revitalization of Egypt's nuclear program, the people are searching for a dream, a national project that proves to us 
that we are strong and capable of doing something fitting of the grandeur of a country that some have begun to doubt. Regional and international prestige, a belief that through nationalistic science, states could prove their stature to accrue a wide range of benefits in terms of economic, political, and military power and influence has been a crucial driver of nuclear programs. Uh, for a region which has been dominated for centuries by outside powers, nuclear power was a way of establishing sovereignty and independence while displaying the country's indigenous capabilities for statecraft and science. In a region where many countries suffer from unemployment, lack of opportunities, and social, political, and economic immobility, nuclear programs could be a real source of unifying national pride. And the third reason, uh, or perhaps rationale would be a better, better term for it, uh, especially after uh, Professor Kitri said, uh, is energy resources. Uh, in the Middle East, um, we have the haves. Uh, we've got the haves. Uh, those with often massive quantities of exportable energy resources and the have-nots, which need to import much of their energy from abroad. Energy consumption, however, is spiking among both of these groups, uh, lowering the amount of exportable, re exportable resources in the case of the former, and dramatically ramping up energy import bills in the case of the latter. So among the haves, there's a desire to develop nuclear energy as a means to prevent their most important export from being consumed by their own population. We've heard this from Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and many others. For example, UAE Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abdullah bin Zayed al Nahyan, uh, wrote in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the UAE's sole interest in nuclear energy is to generate electricity. Some parties have suggested that it should simply burn crude oil to generate needed electricity. While such a course is technically feasible, it will result in a dramatic loss of export revenue for the UAE, as well as a proportionate reduction in the amount of crude oil it could then supply to the global economy. Now this slide, uh, you can see the dramatic rises in consumption in both Iran and the UAE, and what's driving this uh, argument, at least. Uh, these oil exporting countries, I should also add, are generally running highly undiversified economies whose fortunes are intimately tied to the amount of energy that they export, making rising domestic consumption a serious economic threat. Now, the case for the energy importing countries to seek nuclear power is a lot more straightforward. Uh, many of these countries suffer from rising demand and subsequently rising costs. Nuclear power is seen as an investment to prevent the bleeding away of millions of dollars each year in energy import bills. Just to give you a sense of how large these bills are, in Jordan, uh, the country spends approximately a quarter of its national budget importing energy. A Middle East Online report recently noted that in Morocco, 50% uh, of the country's trade deficit was due to energy spending. And here's a, a similar graph for those two countries. Now the obvious question may be, why nuclear energy? Um, why not other forms of renewable energy? We could definitely discuss the other efforts that have been taken in these countries, which do exist to some degree. Um, but it's worth recognizing uh, for our discussion that the renewable energy issue can be used as a smokescreen for nuclear programs, uh, while at the same time being a legitimate concern for these countries. Now, final driver for why these countries have pursued nuclear programs is the importance of strong national leadership in the Middle East. With few exceptions, we're talking about a region <laughs> in which most countries' leaders have uh, very long tenures, to put it kindly. Uh, therefore, nuclear programs have become highly personalized. We can tie a program and its development to a single leader or a small handful of leaders. For example, we can think of the Israeli nuclear program as being uh, primarily a product of Ben-Gurion, the Iranian program as being driven first by the Shah and later by Ayatollah Khamenei. Nasser, Saddam Hussein, and Muammar Gaddafi were the prime movers of their country's programs, and Gaddafi is also the catalyst for the decision to walk away from Libya's, or for Libya to walk away from its program. What is the implication of this? First, for many of these leaders, national and personal prestige were one and the same. Ensuring the nation's nuclear legacy could be a means to solidifying a leader's personal legacy as well. And second, it exemplifies the institutional weakness of many of these states. As a consequence, the pursuit of nuclear programs has often been more start and stop, more reflection of leaders' whims, than necessarily of institutional progress or inertia. Okay, so let's move on to Iran. Uh, here's a map of some of Iran's known nuclear facilities, uh, and it's as of 2006, so you may notice uh, some emissions there. Uh, first, though, some caveats. Uh, it's difficult to make an assessment of Iran's program. 
We do not have full knowledge of its capabilities, and we have perhaps even less concrete knowledge of its intentions. If Iran is developing nuclear weapons or breakout capability, is it offensive for political and military utility, or as a cover for its activities and influence in other countries? Or is it defensive as some form of deterrence against its existential antagonists, be they the US, Israel, or others? If it is defensive or for deterrent capabilities, is it to defend the state or rather to defend the regime? These are all up for discussion. Now, all four of the characteristics which I discussed earlier have encouraged the Iran's program. Let me just pull out uh, and stress two unique characteristics to Iran's motivations. Uh, the first one is a sort of acute phobia of outside intervention and influence. Iran's recent history is full of traumatic examples of such intervention, and the regime's aversion to outside influence and desire for a deterrent trump card is certainly tied to this. And second, Many Iranians believe that their civilization, uh, which dates back over 2,000 years, uh, has a rightful position as a regional superpower. Uh, and this has made the prestige factor and the sort of uh, rights discussion, which was talked about in the last panel, uh, particularly relevant here. Uh, consider for a moment this December 2006 poll uh, of Iranians on the reasons uh, for their nuclear program. You notice that two of the top three reasons are prestige related. Now, taking a page out of Israel's policy of nuclear ambiguity, Iran's nuclear program uh, has been ambiguous, or at least perceived as such. In November, Newsweek quoted a diplomat who is uh, expressing, probably in, in less than PC terms, uh, their frustration with uh, trying to decipher Iran. The diplomat said, it's like playing chess with a monkey. You get them the checkmate, and then they swallow the king. Uh, <laughs> Some of, some of Iran's nuclear facilities have been inspected, and they're known comparatively well. Other facilities, such as the one at Comer revealed in September, and even you know, the revelations yesterday are another example of this, uh, have been very secretive, leading to speculation as to the intent of the nuclear program. And by the same token, many high-ranking Iranian officials have emphasized the country's lack of interest in nuclear weapons, highlighted by Supreme Leader Khamenei's fatwa against the production, stockpiling, and use of nuclear weapons. Still, many have found this hard to square with the violent rhetoric which seems to emanate from the regime on a constant basis. This too has led to international ambiguity over the goal of Iran's nuclear program. Now, how has this posture affected the regional security environment? Countries are delving into their own nuclear research, threatening region-wide proliferation. Saudi Arabia and Egypt are the two countries of concern most often mentioned here, although Turkey, the UAE, and others also enter into this conversation. Iran's program has encouraged a climate of fear and mistrust along sectarian, ideological, ethnic, and even geographic lines. While these fault lines have always existed, uh, they've been exacerbated by Iran's program. An internal discord among sub-regional blocs has been heightened to some degree as the Gulf Cooperation Council and the Arab League uh, grapple with how to collectively respond to Iran's program. Northern and, southern, southern, excuse me, northern and southern Gulf discord has also become a bit more apparent. Always controversial U.S. security involvement in the region has increased, and in the Iranian nuclear capabilities developed, many countries in the region would try to crowd under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. The region has become increasingly militarized, if that is indeed possible. Uh, the UAE alone has purchased $17 billion of U.S. hardware over the last two years, including Patriot anti-missile batteries and 80 F-16s. And there are reports that Israel has added submarine-based nuclear capability. Uh, since much of Iran's program relies on Russian technology, its neighbors are fearful of another Chernobyl at a site such as Bushehir, uh, which is in the southern part of the country, which could lead to the contamination of the air and drinking water of Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE. And if I'm not mistaken, Bushehir is actually closer to the capitals of all four of those countries than it is to Tehran. Uh, there are also fears that a nuclear Iran could project its influence throughout the region to the detriment of other states' interests. The Washington Post recently asked the retired Arab general uh, what would happen if Iran tested the nuclear device. He replied, every country in the region will open their files and decide again what to do. If nuclear weapons appear to be the road to becoming a world power, why shouldn't that be us? The potential for a nuclear arms race is clearly apparent, and this does not make for a pretty picture at all. So that's the reaction among those in power. What has been the popular reaction in the region to Iran's program? A fair amount of public opinion in the Arab world, especially further from the Gulf, is actually somewhat sympathetic, 
seeing Iran's program as a response to the perceived double standard of the international community, turning a blind eye to Israel's program in particular and India and Pakistan's programs to a lesser degree. And the cartoons in this slide, which I hope you can read, uh, are two examples of this. Mohammed Al Sayed Saeed, Deputy Director of Al Akram Center for Political and Strategic Studies in Cairo, has said, even if it takes an arms race, people don't mind. What we have here is wounded dignity and revulsion about the lack of fairness and double standards. In this BBC poll of different countries' takes on Iran's program, two Arab countries actually lead the pack in terms of belief that Iran's nuclear program is strictly for energy purposes. And in this poll of levels of concern, if Iran were to develop nuclear weapons, the US and the EU3 appear to be the most concerned, with Turkey and Iraq displaying some of the lowest levels of concern. So what does all this tell us? First, there's a distinct dichotomy between political elites and non-elites on this issue, as there are on many others in the region. Second, there may be a different degree of receptivity to a nuclear Iran in the region than Western media often implies. It would be far from universally welcomed, but some quarters are not so adverse to it, for better or worse. Now, to wrap up uh, in the time remaining, uh, let me discuss the political history of creating a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Uh, here is a map of the world's nuclear weapons free zones, just for comparison's sake. Uh, the first official calls for a zone in the region came in 1974, led by the Shah of Iran and Egypt, uh, which, whose co sponsored UNGA Resolution 3263 in support of such a zone. This was in part an attempt to flush out Israel's secret of the program. Israel initially rebuffed this, but produced its own draft in 1980, uh, calling for direct negotiations between the countries of the region prior to such a zone. This discrepancy reflects two polls that we still see today. One poll, taken by the Arab states and Iran, is that Israel's accession to the NPT should be a first step towards general regional denuclearization, disarmament, and a comprehensive peace. The other poll, taken by Israel, is just the opposite. A comprehensive peace should precede denuclearization and disarmament. Yet there seems to be a general agreement on the sentiment of a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone as much as it's been used as a political football. And let me just share this slide, uh, which I find really interesting, uh, about support for a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, if you notice, Iranians and Americans are, are nearly identical in their support for a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. In fact, if you just look at who supports it, the, the four columns on the left, they are identical, 71% of people in both countries support the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. So we agree on the goal, uh, it's just needing to get there, that's obviously the hard part. Now pressure for a zone has built in the last two decades. In 1990, Egypt began a push for a WMD free zone, which was adopted in UNSCR 687, which ended the 1991 Gulf War. At the 1995 NPT Review Conference, Egypt and other Arab states argued that the indefinite extension of the NPT should not be supported without addressing Israel's NPT non-accession. Consequently, the conference adopted a resolution on the Middle East which called on all countries in the region to accede to the NPT and to put their facilities under IAEA safeguards. This resolution was confirmed, or reaffirmed, at later review conferences. This year, Egypt will chair both the New Agenda Coalition and the Non-Aligned Movement at the review conference, ensuring that discussion in the Middle East resolution will certainly be on tap. Now, unfortunately, real negotiations for Middle East nuclear weapons free zone have not progressed far, in large part because neither side wants to make the first move, as neither side trusts the other. Iran's nuclear prog program, uh, in progress, however, will catalyze one of two, I think, eventual scenarios in the region. Uh, first, a Middle East with multiple nuclear programs, reflecting our country's quest for power, influence, and prestige, and lack of security, existential or otherwise, seriously challenging the efficacy and existence of the non-proliferation regime. Or, one taking steps toward the WMD free zone with a fragile, more multi-track peace process and a reinforced global non-proliferation regime. The need could not be more urgent for a push towards nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, as we've been hearing all day, uh, backed by thorough inspections of all countries' nuclear programs in the region. Otherwise, we're staring down the future of an increasingly nuclearized intense Middle East, a state of affairs which is highly unlikely to end well. Hopefully, the NPT Review Conference in May will provide the necessary momentum for us all to avoid such a fate. Thank you.
Thank you. Our next speaker, some of you were lucky enough to hear him this morning, is Mr. Jonathan Granoff, who is currently the president of the Global Security Initiative. Jonathan Granoff is an attorney, author, and international advocate emphasizing legal, ethical, and spiritual dimensions of human development and security with, with a specific focus on advancing the rule of law to address the threats posed by nuclear weapons. In addition to his work with the Global Security Initiative, Institute, rather, he serves as the senior advisor to the American Bar Association's Committee on Arms Control and National Security. He is the co-chair of the American Bar Association's Blue Ribbon Task Force on Nuclear Nonproliferation. He is also a senior advisor to the Nobel Peace Laureate Summit and has served as vice president and UN representative of the Lawyers Alliance for World Security. He serves on numerous boards, uh, numerous governing and advisory boards, including the ABA International Law Section, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, Fortune Forum, the Jane Goodall Institute, Bipartisan Security Group, and the Middle Power Powers Initiative. Let's, let's please welcome Mr. Jonathan Graham. Uh, I want to jump right into uh, like how deep is the hole that we're in since we're talking about moving forward. Um, and uh, may I, I, we hope that we can be wind in your sails because you have a formidable task and um, there has to be forward momentum perceived in May. Uh, for many of us, that will be sufficient. Uh, but let's say a little bit of where we are. Um, uh, one of the core bargains in 1995 to gain the extension of the treaty was progress on a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Uh, the country that's most vociferous now in advancing this proposition is Iran. And for many, Iran's credibility doesn't pass the laugh test. So uh, there, there really has been no progress on this. And it's unlikely that there will be progress before May. Uh, that's a very serious hurdle, especially when you have Egypt uh, there. And Egypt has pressure, domestic pressure, uh, saying, well, what is the NPT doing for us? What do we get for it? Look at India. In 1995, one of the commitments was to work to universalize the treaty. And what did the United States do? It's, it's taken the country of India, which has refused to join the treaty, and given it full scope nuclear sharing, materials, technology, so it gets nuclear weapons and nuclear sharing. So countries that are in the treaty that are being asked to ad adopt additional protocols and ad additional constraints on proliferation look and say, well, here's a country that has flaunted, has flaunted nonproliferation and disarmament, and they're getting all the advantages. So they have domestic pressure within their country saying, well, what did, you, what did you get for us lately? And then they have a neighbor, in India, they have a neighbor who doesn't have any safeguards, doesn't even admit to what, it, what the world knows that it's doing. On top of that, February 1st, the United States announced a 10% increase in nuclear weapons spending for next year. Then we have this great divide between very, I, I think, sincere, high rhetoric of the president, and what's going to be delivered in May. We're not going to have a ratified test ban treaty. It's not going to happen by then. We're not going to have negotiations commenced with the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. It's not going to happen in Geneva. It's, it works by consensus at the CD. We will have some cuts under start, I hope, but I don't know if that'll even be ratified by then. But we certainly won't have anything that demonstrates commitment to irreversibility and greater transparency. So the negotiators are going to be going in with very little on the table. And even if we had a CTBT, much of the world says, we already paid for that in 1995. We paid for that already. So what are you bringing to us that's new? So that's kind of a problem. Now, Resolution 1887. 
now a little context because that's been spoken about. It was absolutely historic that President Obama chose in September to chair the Security Council and pick this subject. I mean, he could have picked any number of more popular subjects if he was, if he was really an opportunist. He could have picked climate. They just had two days of discussions on climate. He could have picked poverty. Poverty, you get pictures and you can get a lot of sympathy. And he could have, and he could have probably gotten some, he probably could have gotten some momentum and even come up with some money on the table and scored a lot more points. But he picked nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. And I think that was very courageous. But at the end of the day, there was no challenge for a no first use pledge. There was one country mentioned a nuclear weapons convention, Austria, said it would be a good idea, but didn't invite anybody to a preparatory conference. Um, and the, the strongest, the strongest uh, benefit that the resolution that ultimately was adopted gave to the non-nuclear weapons states was simply a reaffirmation of the negative security assurances in one of the last operative paragraphs. Well, there was a nice thing that said that civil society does make a contribution to the process. So those of us here who work in the field, Nick, John, my colleagues here, we, you know, it was, it was nice to get a, a, a nod, but the negative security assurances seem to me to be absolutely morally unambiguous. The idea that you're telling countries that you're going to forever forswear developing nuclear weapons, they should at least get a promise that they won't be attacked by nuclear weapons. How could you, I mean, how, that just seems so obvious. And that could have been made part of the resolution, but it wasn't. All it was was it acknowledged, it acknowledged that pledges had been made. It could have been a binding resolution in which at least the P5 said, we make negative security assurances. We will not attack nor threaten to attack countries that do not have nuclear weapons full stop. And that would have been given, giving, giving the world something, but it didn't do that. What did it do? And what, what has this high rhetoric done? I, th I, I don't take a cynical approach. I think that it has created the political space that I think it's created the political space where a lot of discussion and good ideas can have greater currency than they otherwise would have. I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, that our president is a crass opportunist just fooling around. I wish he would be more assertive, and let me give an example of what I mean by that. The first preparatory conference for this review conference, because there are preparatory conferences in between the five-year review conferences, the first preparatory conference, Rose Gutmuller came and really changed the atmosphere. Because remember, we had had eight years in which the world did not trust the bona fides of America's commitment to the rule of law and restraint of power. And in the 2000 NPT review, real progress was made. And in the 2005 NPT review, there, was the, the, there were the spoilers uh, uh, in the Middle East, Iran and Egypt pushing, jamming. But the United States position was, we don't want to have our previous commitments reviewed. Well, what kind of review, what, what, kind of a, what kind of an attitude is that to go to a review conference and say, we want to focus on the non-proliferation aspects of the treaty and we don't want our progress on disarmament to be thoroughly reviewed. That created a terrible atmosphere of cynicism and our ambassador, to the credit of this administration, Rose Gutmuller, came and laid out, uh, laid out America's commitment to progress on nonproliferation and disarmament and, re and reaffirmation of working with uh, other countries, not operating as a, as Hans Blick said, as a lone wolf, but operating as a lead wolf. And the atmosphere was wonderful. But Within three weeks, General Chilton from Stratcom had a press conference in which he said that the United States maintains all options on the table in the event of a cyber attack, including nuclear weapons. And then he went on to say that he didn't see any problem in this attitude. Well, there is a huge problem in it. One is there are the negative security assurances that we made. 
Two, it is customary humanitarian law, which is proportionality. And three, cyber attacks are really difficult to know the origin. And the blitheness with which he brandished the nuclear option, I thought was just absolutely shocking. And I found it shocking that there was no reprimand, at least a public reprimand of some kind at the highest levels, that nuclear weapons are not, they're not toys, they're not big guns, they're not things to be brandished in this way. This is not responsible. The United States is serious about lowering the currency of these weapons. And when you talk about them in this way, it diminishes our credibility. But he said it, nothing happened. Um, there are several policies that I think could make a big difference, and I'm going to list some of them. Uh, Dr. Burroughs was instrumental in articulating them very clearly in what I commend to your attention, a brief, a global undertaking realizing the disarmament promise of the NPT, part of the subject of this, this panel, and we brought a, a bunch of them here. And, and this, was, this was created with a lot of people having input, a lot of, a, a, you know, and also consultations with a lot of countries. Um, one, reducing the things that could actually really advance the agenda. Reaffirm the NPT commitment to a diminishing role for nuclear weapons in security policies as a step toward non-use in any circumstance and the elimination of the weapons. Two, oppose counterforce and counter-value doctrines. Well, that's, th that's somewhat arcane, but awfully important. Uh, because counterforce doctrine requires a readiness to carry out a comprehensive nuclear attack against an en enemy's nuclear capabilities. It's a Cold War nuclear war fighting doctrine and implies maintaining nuclear forces in a quick launch status capable of carrying out a preemptive strike and increases pressure to resort to nuclear weapons in a crisis. In the U.S.-Russian context, it also is perceived by many to require maintenance of large and complex arsenals, both to carry out counterforce attacks and to have usable nuclear weapons that would survive such an attack. And a counter-value doctrine projects a second strike against cities, which is just morally absolutely uh, not acceptable under any circumstances. And then the doctrine of extended deterrence. Uh, exactly, exactly against whom are we, ex we, we have an umbrella. We have an umbrella over countries in, in Europe. Is the umbrella designed to deter Russia from attacking Germany now? I mean, you know, is Russia, is Russia on the brink of attacking Germany? I, I think it's time to close part of the umbrella and really reevaluate the role of extended nuclear deterrence. William Perry in 1994 said he could hardly conceive of a circumstance in which our conventional forces wouldn't be sufficient. And I agree with that. So we need to phase out uh, this, the deterrence doctrine as it is and the deployment of nuclear weapons on foreign territories. Reaffirm the NPT commitment to strengthen assurances of non-use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear weapon states, nuclear we negative security assurances. We need to reaffirm the unequivocal undertaking to eliminate nuclear arsenals. We should be commending the start process as part of a process, that it's not the cuts that, we're gonna, that we see now are just the beginning, but we need to set as the marker coming down to sufficiently low numbers to bring in all the nuclear weapon states in negotiations, and that should be stated as the goal, because cynicism will set in during the NPT process, and if there aren't, land, you know, if there aren't goalposts that seem realistic put in the ground, that cynicism could really corrode the treaty. And one of these would be a commitment by the P5 that when Russia and the United States come down to sufficiently low numbers, they will commence negotiations on elimination and demand that the other states with nuclear weapons would join. All states with nuclear weapons to openly declare the size of their stockpiles and commit not to increase them nor improve them. No. Uh, quantitative proliferation nor qualitative proliferation. 
Uh, reaffirm the NPT commitment to lower the operational status of nuclear weapons. Why are they still on alert status when we're not existential threats? Russia, Russia still has them on that alert status. We heard earlier uh, today about some of the mishaps, which would be much, the, the dangers would be dramatically reduced. And that's something that the president could unilaterally do. And he could do that, you know, he could challenge Medvedev to do the same thing. I don't like the fact that we're subject to a potential computer error that the Russians, the Russians might make. Uh, support an MPT commitment to, to establish a comprehensive UN-based accounting system. John talked about that. I would like us to see the, the NPT have a permanent secretariat. It seems very unfair to, that, uh, to put the burden uh, basically on, um, uh, on Ambassador uh, Duarte's uh, uh, understaffed, overworked, underpaid office in the UN to just scramble to function as a, almost like an ad hoc secretariat. I mean, there's no, can you imagine here is an institution that the security of the world depends on and they don't have a standing secretariat? What would that do? It would allow for people to, to formalize complaints in between these review conferences and discuss them and have a context to, to iron some of them out. And then, if, and then of course, we have, we, have, we have to demonstrate the commitment of early entry into force of a comprehensive test ban treaty. If we have to demonstrate to the world that we have a strategy for getting there, you know, that we really are going to bring in countries that are, that are that are sitting outside of it, and the United States can't lead in that unless there's real commitment. And I think that's. I think there has to be a real public challenge to those uh, to to the to the fact that it's being turned into a partisan a partisan debate. Um, these are just a few of the of the suggestions that I have, but I have one very important one, and then I'm going to end on that, which is. Um, the Secretary General's five-point plan uh, is very comprehensive, and it's universal. And it addresses strengthening the NPT, but it also, it also talks about uh, the first premise in it is the virtue of a nuclear weapons convention. And the Secretary General has circulated a model nuclear weapons convention to all the countries in the world. It's been introduced into the General Assembly by Malaysia and Costa Rica. And uh, what a nuclear weapons convention would do, it would, it would, it would address the incoherence of the regime that, that Dr. Burroughs was talking about, function very much like a chemical weapons convention. Now, the best argument against it, and, it, and I do think this argument does carry some merit, is <clears throat> the political circumstances are not ripe for it. The international infrastructure to make it credible and enforceable is not there. It's a reasonable argument. I would, but if you read the treaty, you'll see that it contemplates all of the steps that would build that infrastructure of peace in the treaty. That the treaty immediately condemns the use of the weapon, not the immediate possession, and then it walks down the ladder with the very same steps that you find in the 13 practical steps. A test ban treaty, strengthening international safeguards, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think I, I come out on the other side of the argument. I think we need to get going on it. But it's, but it's a meritorious argument. I don't think it's a frivolous, bad faith argument to say it's premature. But if, 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 if the treaty is put in the ground as a marker, if a group of countries will get together and begin a preparatory conference and start discussing what are the elements, what needs to be strengthened, how do we get there, then it changes the fulcrum of the debate. It becomes a compass point. It becomes a, a way of establishing a criteria, of saying these policies help create the political circumstances, create the architecture of peace in which a nuclear weapons convention becomes a good and viable course. It becomes, it becomes a standard through which we can evaluate policies. I would say in that standard, the kind of things that Nick was talking about, uh, the, the, uh, the metallurgy chemical research, program would certainly, you'd be able to argue more effectively against it and saying, well, this is obviously moving against the direction of getting toward a convention. And the policies that move us in that direction, uh, I think some of the 
uh, non-proliferation aspirations of the administration, which will make the world safer in and of themselves, independently of quid pro quos under the treaty. They are security enhancing steps, the things that, uh, Maya, that you were talking about. They will make the world safer. Without, even if we didn't have an NPT, they are good things to do, to, to just simply make the world safer. Nuclear materials are inadequately safeguarded, inadequately monitored. They're extraordinarily dangerous and hazardous. All of the steps of nonproliferation that, we, that, that countries are saying, well, we're not so sure we want to give you more nonproliferation constraints because we're not seeing progress in disarmament. It changes the framework of the debate. The debate is, oh, these are good things to help move to a nuclear weapons convention. It's not a quid pro quo. This is something that helps us all move toward that goal of the universal, legally verifiable elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, and last, but uh, there's two elements that are very important here. The first one is, for lawyers, there is an argument that a nuclear weapons convention would divert attention from the NPT, would be, uh, is outside of the NPT process. I think that's not an honest argument. The NPT contemplates subsidiary instruments. Uh, for example, on the nonproliferation side, it contemplates a test ban treaty. It contemplates a fissile material cutoff treaty. There are many elements that are other instruments that are being negotiated to fulfill the nonproliferation aspects. Article 6 is not self-enforcing. Like Medellin, what's the, what's the case? Medellin, the issue of uh, treaties being self-enforcing. This is a real inside joke. But uh, <laughs> uh, Article 6 is not, uh, in and of itself, does not get to disarmament. It contemplates other instruments. And the other instrument that would get us there most quickly would be a nuclear weapons convention. Um, and uh, for those of us who believe that the world as a whole is facing different paradigms, different ways of organizing governance, one way is the pursuit of, uh, do the pursuit of dominance, which some of the people in STRATCOM who also write some of the stuff on space weapons call full spectrum dominance. That's the term they're using. It's actually their term. It's in their doctrine, uh, document Vision 2020. Uh, full, full spectrum dominance. That just seems so un-American to me, so anti-democratic in principle. Uh, and deterrence. Or, or identifying common interests and basing working together on the rule of law. So in a law school, we, uh, what we have found in America that basing common interests and developing society on the principles of the rule of law, accountability, transparency, limited exercise of power, actually breeds stability. And this is a very strong American value. And I, I strongly believe that it's, it, it is a good universal way of going forward. And if we want to, if we accept the principle that the President of the United States has said, the security of a world without nuclear weapons, that a world without nuclear weapons would be more secure, the way in which, to, in the way in which I think we should get there is by pursuing a nuclear weapons convention. So I would urge uh, everyone here who's studying this subject to start uh, to get a, you, go to, you can go to the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policies website or the Global Security Institute's website, and there's a, there's a really excellent uh, book called Securing Our Survival uh, that analyzes the way this treaty would work. Um, I was at a conference in India with the Prime Minister of India, and with Ambassador Duarte, and he said publicly that uh, India would support such a process. It won't lead, but if it's challenged, Maybe, it, maybe that's the way to go. Otherwise, how are we going to get India into this game? And if we don't get India into this game, how are we going to get Pakistan into this game? And remember, one other thing about Iran. Iran, is, Iran has, some, has a neighbor right that borders it. Pakistan, not particularly stable and not particularly friendly to Iran, that has nuclear weapons. And I don't like the, the, and the you know, and the dominoes can fall very quickly should conflict arise with nuclear weapons. And I don't like 
you know, the fact that our future is dependent on the vicissitudes of the political processes in regions that are very, very dangerous. And the way to resolve that is a global, universal, legally verifiable norm eliminating nuclear weapons, a device uh, unworthy of civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Granoff. And Mr. Granoff also has quite a bit of literature by the door. In case you're interested, I highly recommend to pick some up. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Uh, ambassador, rather, Ambassador Sergio Duarte. Ambassador Duarte of Brazil was appointed in July of 2007 by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as the High Representative for Disarmament at the United Nations. A, rear, a career diplomat, he holds the rank of Ambassador in the Brazilian Foreign Service, where he has served for over 48 years. In 2005, he was elected President of the Seventh Review Conference of the Parties to the Treaty on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. During his career, he has attended 12 sessions of the First Committee of the General Assembly and six sessions of the United Nations Disarmament Commission. He has represented his country at many other international meetings and attended many sessions on the field of disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation. So without further ado, let's please welcome Ambassador Sergio Duarte. Thank you, thank you very much for inviting me here, the law school of the Unipec University. It's hard to speak after Jonathan Granoff because he's so eloquent and uh, it's hard to match uh, this, his powers of uh, convincing. But it's also easy because he uh, leaves uh, enough time for the next speaker uh, to, 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 to do his piece. <laughs> The, my office, the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs, attaches, of course, great importance to the education, to disarmament and non-proliferation education. And I warmly welcome the deeper involvement of academics, both in studying these particular issues and in exploring, <coughs> excuse me, exploring new initiatives to achieve concrete progress in the years ahead. The title of this panel, rather enigmatic, What Should? Interrogation, The Politics and Policy of Nuclear Security, suggests that we have reached the point that we should turn to normative issues. We all know that the future of the NPT is entirely in the hands of states parties. Yet their individual policies and practices are influenced by an enormous variety of political factors that complicate the process of making predictions about the outcome of the treaty's next review conference, or indeed of the future of the treaty itself. Some of these political factors relate to the treaty review process in harmonizing efforts to strengthen each of the three treaty's three pillars of nuclear disarmament, nuclear non-proliferation, and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. The outcomes of the treaty review process, however, are also significantly influenced by the diverse trends and developments well outside the meeting rooms of these review conferences, <coughs> including, including for, for example, broader north-south disputes about access to nuclear technology and the relevant development assistance. Other ch challenges in these review conferences relate to the differences among states' parties in the use of some basic terminology. Consider, for example, the various meanings that have been attached to the word non-proliferation. When most people hear this term, they think it applies just to the spread of nuclear weapons to additional states. This is often called horizontal proliferation. Almost all stories in the news media, for example, use the term in this sense. Yet, experts in this field also recognize what is called vertical proliferation, involving the qualitative improvement of, or, or the expansion of existing nuclear arsenals. And then there is what might, called, might be called the geographical proliferation, 
or namely the transportation and deployment of nuclear weapons around the world by air, sea and on land. Another term used in our panel today, nuclear security, is also subject to a wide variety of definitions. Let us consider just for a moment three possible interpretations, and then I'll perhaps turn and or suggest a fourth interpretation of the term security. Not surprisingly, states that possess nuclear weapons, along with those that are covered by the nuclear umbrella, believe that nuclear weapons serve a legitimate security, national security purpose, typically justified in language drawing upon the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. In this interpretation, nuclear security might be thought of as a form of national security that is achieved through the possession of nuclear weapons. While all states that possess nuclear weapons have publicly supported the goal of global nuclear disarmament, until that goal is achieved, these states have focused their efforts on nuclear arms control activities rather than disarmament. The Russian Federation and the United States, for example, are, are nearing agreement on a replacement for the START Treaty, which will lower the numbers of deployed strategic nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. Other states with such weapons have closed down nuclear test sites, halted production of fissile material for weapons, eliminated certain types of nuclear weapons or delivery systems, and other such steps. The common aim of such activities, however, is to preserve some form of nuclear deterrence at lower levels. So I will call this approach nuclear security one. For decades, however, the world community has also sought to achieve a more secure world by preventing additional states from acquiring nuclear weapons. And this is the familiar non-proliferation approach that I will call nuclear security two. Safeguards administered by the International Atomic Ag Energy Agency are intended to serve this goal by verifying that nuclear materials are used only for peaceful purposes. And this approach also relies upon export controls, information sharing, especially among, nu among nuclear supply states, and various other legal, political, and diplomatic means. Yet, since these non-proliferation efforts have customarily centered specifically on activities of states, another approach to nuclear security has emerged in the recent years, focused on the goal of preventing non-state actors from acquiring nuclear weapons. And this could be nuclear security three. As with non-proliferation, these efforts rely upon export controls and information sharing but also involve controls over the physical protection of nuclear material and domestic criminal legislation to prohibit the illicit acquisition and use of such material. To be sure, there have been a lot of activities underway in the world community to address the last two dimensions of nuclear security, namely those rela relating to non-proliferation and to preventing nuclear terrorism. Foremost am uh, for among these are the following. In 2004, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1540, which obligates all states to have laws and regulations prohibiting the proliferation of nuclear weapons or their acquisition by non-state actors. A year later, the UN General Assembly adopted and opened for signature the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. In April 2009, President Obama delivered his historic speech in Prague, where he outlined the vision of achieving a world free of nuclear weapons, and he first proposed the convening of a global summit on nuclear security, now renamed Washington Summit on Nuclear Security. At its own summit meeting in, in 24th of September, the Security Council reaffirmed that the proliferation of all such weapons constitute a threat to international peace and security, and adopted Resolution 1887 focused primarily on non-proliferation and counterterrorism issues. And in July 2009, the White House formally announced that President Obama would host a nuclear security summit, summit in 2010 on non-proliferation, and that would be on terrorism. And that would be, as I said, the Washington Nuclear Security Summit. It will be, now it's now scheduled for the 13th of April. Together, these three approaches to nuclear security that I have just outlined 
have guided significant individual and collective efforts in the world community. But do they tell the whole story? Could there be another dimension of nuclear security that needs to be discussed? Yes, it did. And this brings me to Nuclear Security 4, which consists of countless efforts that have also been underway to promote nuclear security through the elimination or prohibition of nuclear weapons. This approach is apparent in the work of the International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament in the Global Zero Campaign, which have produced detailed step-by-step -step proposals on how to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. It is a theme that has appeared in op-eds by George Schultz, per William Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn in the Wall Street Journal, and similar proposals by senior statesmen in very, in very, so very many countries. On October 28, 2008, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched his own five-point proposal for global nuclear disarmament and followed it up on 8 December 2009, just last year, with an action plan of specific initiatives to implement it. I will return to these efforts shortly. Additional initiatives have come both from states and non-governmental organizations, which together share a common premise that the greatest security from nuclear weapon threats will result from the elimination of such weapons. This is an approach that rejects the doctrine of nuclear deterrence. And while it recognizes that nuclear arms control, non-proliferation, and counterterrorism measures each have their own important contributions to make in achieving a nuclear weapon-free world, the disarmament approach to nuclear security views such roles as necessary but not sufficient to eliminate such threats. Now, what do the, these all uh, various interpretations of nuclear security have to do with the, with the NPT and the forthcoming review conference? It is quite clear that the treaty explicitly addresses the goal of disarmament and the prevention of the spread of nuclear weapons. It also obligates states' parties to undertake certain actions in the pursuit of these goals, including good faith negotiations on nuclear disarmament, the agreement to safeguards, the recognition of the inalienable right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and commitments not to seek nuclear weapons or to assist other states to acquire them. All of these issues will therefore receive considerable attention at the review conference. The NPT, however, was not intended to serve as a treaty against nuclear terrorism, a subject that was later covered by other legal instruments, including the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials and the Nuclear Terrorism Convention. Yet, while there is widespread recognition among all NPT states parties that disarmament and non-proliferation are legitimate and effective ways to strengthen international peace and security, there are also deep and persisting differences over the precise relationship between these approaches to nuclear security, and additional differences over what priority should be given to activities undertaken parallel to the NPT concerning the prevention of nuclear terrorism. The nuclear weapon states have been articulating what might be called a sequential approach to achieving the central goals of the NPT. They have, for example, been listing various conditions that should be first satisfied before disarmament could be achieved. A key theme of the Nuclear Security Summit in Washington will be the importance of enhanced controls in non-proliferation and counterterrorism as steps that would facilitate future progress in disarmament. But the vast majority of non-nuclear states parties do not accept a sequential approach, and they view disarmament and non-proliferation as mutually reinforcing activities that must be pursued together. Having already agreed to forswear the acquisition of nuclear weapons, and having further agreed to intrusive safeguards to confirm the peaceful uses of their nuclear materials, these states' parties have increasingly been calling for greater progress in the field of disarmament. In their view, disarmament initiatives that satisfy certain multilaterally agreed criteria, namely transparency, irreversibility, verification, and binding commitments, are the most urgent needs in the field of nuclear security. 
to these states appeals for stricter controls over the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, enhanced safeguards, and assorted other measures to reduce the risk of nuclear terrorism, all of these appeals to them appear unconvincing, even contrived distractions from what should be the top priority disarmament agenda. This, I believe, is the best description I can offer right now of the central theme of our panel today, the politics and policy of nuclear security in the weeks before the 2010 in NPT Review Conference. In many respects, the event will be a forum for deliberating different interpretations, not just of the NPT, but of nuclear security. To some extent, a good case could be made for dispensing with this term nuclear security altogether. <coughs> <coughs> Both because of its multiple interpretations and also because of its implication that the central challenge is one merely of limiting nuclear weapon risks, including the risk of use. A far better approach would be to consider instead what measures would be needed to ensure security for all in a world of nuclear weapons, without nuclear weapons. For, for lack of a better term, let's call this non-nuclear security. <laughs> Frankly, this is what the United, States, United Nations member states have been seeking for over six decades. The Charter refer referred briefly to the goals of disarmament and the regulation of armaments. By 1947, the General Assembly had adopted resolutions clarifying that disarmament referred to the elimination of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, while the regulation of armaments referred to limits on conventional arms that would allow for states to retain some of such arms for uses widely accepted as legitimate, such as self-defense and international peacekeeping. In 1959, the General Assembly combined these goals under the term general and complete disarmament, which since 1978 has been the United Nations' ultimate objective in this field. It is, of course, also an objective found in the NPT and in a dozen of other multilater multilateral treaties. Under the UN Charter, member states are also subject to additional obligations that go well beyond these commitments relating to weapons. These include duties to refrain from the threat or use of force, to resolve disputes peacefully, and to respect the territorial integrity and sovereign equality of all member states. <coughs> the, United <coughs> the United Nations has therefore long defined and stood for a form of security this has been called international peace and security, that far transcends anything offered by the term nuclear security. Given that our present conference is co-hosted by the School of Law of Quinnipiac University, I think it's fitting to note that efforts at the UN in disarmament have placed a heavy emphasis on the importance of strengthening the rule of law in this emerging field that I have called non-nuclear security. The entire apparatus of, of, of institutions that we call the United Nations Disarmament Machinery is essentially an intricate system dedicated to the advancement of global disarmament and non-proliferation norms. Political deliberations occur in the United Nations Disarmament Commission and in the first committee of the General Assembly, while the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva has a mandate to negotiate legally binding multilateral treaties. As I mentioned earlier, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has launched the five-point proposal and action plan to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. And I would like to draw your attention to the extent that this proposal incorporated initiatives to strengthen the rule of law. He first called upon the, United, upon the NPT nuclear weapon states in particular to fulfill their obligation to undertake negotiations on effective measures leading to nuclear disarmament, as required in Article 6 of the treaty. He stated that they could do this by agreeing to a framework of separate, mutually reinforcing instruments, or by considering negotiating a nuclear weapons convention. His second point dealt with the Security Council, which he encouraged to commence discussions on security issues in the nuclear disarmament process. For this purpose, he also urged the Council to convene a summit on nuclear disarmament, 
and the Council, the Council Summit on 21st September 2009 took a positive first step in this field. As the body with primary responsibility under the Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security, and with other mandates relating to disarmament and the regulation of armaments, the Council surely has, an important, has important contributions to make down the road on all of these areas. The Secretary General's third point related to several specific rule of law issues, including the need to negotiate a fissile material treaty, to bring the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty into force, and to encourage the nuclear weapon states to ratify the protocols to all five regional nuclear weapon free zone treaties. He also supported the negotiation of a treaty to establish such a zone in the Middle East, as has long been proposed both in the United Nations General Assembly and at NPT review conferences. The fourth point referred to the need for certain improvements relating to transparency and accountability in the disarmament process, urging the nuclear weapon states to provide documentation to the United Nations Secretariat about the progress they are making in fulfilling their responsibilities in that field. And the fifth and final point related to a series of complementary measures, including additional bans covering missiles and space weapons and limits on the production and trade of conventional arms. He also urged the General Assembly to convene a world summit on disarmament, non-proliferation and terrorist use of weapons of mass destruction. And I was pleased to see that the General Assembly will hold a thematic debate next month on disarmament and world security. It's called, the title of it is Disarmament and World Security, Challenges for the International Society and the Role of the United Nations. This has been an initiative of the President of the General Assembly. I must not conclude my remarks today without returning to the normative question posed in the title of this panel concerning what should happen next. In terms of nuclear security, despite the multiple political uses, I know it's hard to dispute that a world without nuclear weapons will require some very stringent and reliable controls over nuclear materials, nuclear facilities, and sensitive nuclear technology. The classic challenge in achieving nuclear disarmament is to prevent cheating or opportunities for breakout, and this alone would argue for a wide variety of controls. Such controls are, are best pursued as part of the disarmament process itself and not as a precondition for that process. Yes, we will surely need strict nuclear security controls, yet we will also need to get on with the hard work of planning for the larger challenge of achieving security in a nuclear weapon-free world. This will involve a lot more than simply locking down nuclear materials, imposing greater controls on their use, or reiterating tried serious appeals to keep such weapons from falling in the wrong hands. In fact, there are no right hands holding nuclear weapons. I have little doubt that the overwhelming majority of the participants at the next review conference of the NPT recognize the extent that the future treaty really does depend upon concrete progress in disarmament. My fear is that an inflexible insistence by some on the prior achievement of more stringent non-proliferation controls will prove, prove counterproductive to achieving both non-proliferation and disarmament goals. At worst, such an approach could even lead us to a world, world in which additional countries will pursue their own nuclear deterrence <clears throat> using the self-help logic of nuclear security. In his Prague speech in April 2009, President Obama spoke of America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Notice that he did not say that we must first have peace and security before we could achieve such a goal. He recognized how peace and security will be strengthened in a world without nuclear weapons. So let us together get on with the hard work of identifying what is needed to shift the agenda to the politics and policy of non-nuclear security. You in this audience, whether as political scientists, lawyers, scientists, or scholars in countless related academic disciplines, each of you has special assets to bring to this process. I urge you to not just investigate what needs to be, to be done, but how it can be achieved in our volatile, highly political world. You can help in the search for answers 
to some tough questions, including what specific domestic laws or multilateral conventions will be needed? What are the strengths and shortcomings of existing proposals for legal reforms? What reforms must be needed, might be needed on international institutions on disarmament? And how can conventional arms control best be pursued in parallel with nuclear disarmament? I have only one final prescription. Do not underestimate the potential contributes you can make to this vexing process of disarmament. The world is more open than you might think to fresh thinking and ideas involving creative, practical solutions to chronic problems in this field. A great door is open to all who may wish to enter and contribute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Duarte. So at this time, we'd like to open it up to a few questions. If you have a question, we have a microphone on the side. Otherwise, you can just remain in your seat, but please speak up so the people in the back can hear. Um, I would like to start with the first question, if I can, using my position. And uh, I'd like to ask this to Mr. Jonathan Granoff. Mr. Granoff, in 2001, President Bush announced that the U.S. would be withdrawing from the anti-ballistic missile, or ABM, treaty. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this treaty limited the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and later Russia's ability to defend themselves from a nuclear strike. The theory behind this treaty was that this type of arrangement better upheld peace because the countries were vulnerable to mutual assured destruction. Uh, the United States argued that it would draw better national security in a post-9-11 environment. Uh, in your opinion, has the United States withdrawal undermined global security, or was the ABM treaty an unnecessary Cold War realm? When Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev both wanted to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons in Reykjavik, the, the process that, that under, the, what undermined their commitment and process was the reluctance of the United States to renounce the weaponization of space and the uh, the, the, the missile defense program. And the reason for that is that missile defenses constitute a shield coupled with the sword of nuclear weapons. The sword and the shield make the can, can make the perceived belief in the use of nuclear weapons heightened. Additionally, the same technologies that are, that are being put in place for missile defense are the precursors for the weaponization of space. And the pursuit of the weaponization of space or the military high ground will make the pursuit of disarmament on the earth so much the more difficult. So my opinion is that the anti-ballistic missile treaty, although counterintuitive, ensuring vulnerability, was actually security enhancing. And that, uh, and that the recent affirmation of the Obama administration that we are going to put missile defenses in Romania is going to be perceived as provocative to the Russians making arms control, non-proliferation, and disarmament all the more difficult. Um, so uh, the good news is that it doesn't work very well because of physics. The bad news is that we keep pouring money into it and we might find a way of making it work. And if it works, it will be uh, destabilizing rather than security enhancing. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience have a question? Yes, sir. Yes. I might be uh, misunderstanding something here, but I go ahead and ask anyway. The word consensus was used more than once today with certain entities making their decisions using consensus. I like that idea, but I'm curious as to what prompted them to go that route uh, as opposed to majority rule. Also, will the May uh, review be using consensus? And if so, um, what advantages or disadvantages do you see in them taking that route? Okay. 
Well, I can try to answer at least to make some comments around that. The question of consensus has been increasingly been discussed in the <coughs> several fora and uh, <coughs> institutions dealing with uh, disarmament and non proliferation issues because increasingly we have had seen, we have seen the tendency to reach agreement thwarted by one or two countries that somehow uh, have uh, reservations or, or difficulties with the approaches that are being uh, proposed. Now, for as long as I can remember, consensus has been the rule, and the non-written rule. The uh, 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 rules of procedure uh, of the NPT and other of the Conference on Disarmament and others says that parties to those conferences should do their best, exert the maximum efforts to achieve consensus. It doesn't say that consensus is the rule, but uh, there's been a tendency for past uh, decades to avoid voting on those issues. And the reason, of course, is that these, these questions are very sensitive uh, for different reasons for different countries. And uh, no country wants to be steamrolled, so to speak, into agreeing to things that to it mm, seem to be uh, very uh, dear to their, to their uh, own, own, own security. There are those today who uh, challenge the non-written rule of consensus and say, well, uh, it, sh it could be consensus minus one. But of course, when they say that, uh, it is because someone else is invoking the rule of consensus. But they themselves would invoke it when it came uh, their turn not to agree uh, to something. I don't want to speak of individual countries, but we have had glaring examples in different fields in that. So until we find a better way of working uh, in these very sensitive uh, issues, uh, I think that consensus is probably the, the, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, useful uh, uh, guideline. I must say that has never, uh, not, 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 not always uh, been, been, uh, been observed. <clears throat> and I remember, and I remember because I was there, when the NPT uh, was discussed in the old 18 nation disarmament committee, 10 countries, the five members of the Warsaw Pact and the five members of, the, of, the, of NATO, uh, agreed to the text as amended by the two co-chair, coincidentally the United States and the Soviet Union. But the other eight countries, the remaining eight countries, did not agree to that. And the co-chairs, even so, sent the text to the General Assembly for endorsement. It is one way of thwarting consensus. The, the General Assembly voted on the NPT and uh, commended it and, uh, to, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, adhesion of, of states, to the accession of other states, but, not, not, but, but, but by a vote, not by unanimity, not by consensus, not by, but, but by a majority. So this shows that there are ways. The same, uh, similar thing happened with the, with the CTBT in the, the many years later in the Conference on Disarmament, when one country, India, uh, did not agree did not give its consent you know, to, for the whole conference to send it to the General Assembly, but the conference sent it anyway to the General Assembly. So there are ways of, of uh, doing things and uh, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, using a, a strict uh, view to consensus. But consensus, to my mind, as far as I can perceive, is necessary, is a, is a necessary uh, guard uh, against uh, forcing countries to uh, adopt or, or agree to things that they, they believe are detrimental to their, to their security. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador. Do we have, is there another question in the audience? <coughs> so, yes, Mr. Schulman. I'd like to ask Ambassador Duarte a question about Brazil. Brazil quite famously and in my mind, admirably abandoned its own nuclear weapons project some years ago. Looking back on that, would you say Brazil has increased its security, 
or in some way diminish its security by abandoning the nuclear enterprise? Well, I have to take off my United Nations hat and uh, look for my Brazilian hat, which I have left <laughs> for some time. First of all, what makes you say that Brazil had a nuclear weapons program? Are you sure of what you're saying? No. Or is that because the papers have sometimes said it? I just read the newspapers. <laughs> yeah, don't always believe what you read in the newspapers. Brazil made a decision, a sovereign decision, not to uh, acquire nuclear weapons. And this decision was made uh, after several years of internal discussion. To say that there was a program, and I have to be very candid on that, is something that I cannot, I, I do not know. I simply have no way of knowing. My, my, the, the way I see it and, and what I, I can uh, say from the experience that I have had is that perhaps sections in the Brazilian society in the 1950s and 60s, probably thought of that. Not only the military, also in political uh, fields. In those times, it was, it was general uh, understanding or belief that to possess nuclear weapons was the way to become a great power. And Brazil had its ambitions because of its size, because of its traditions, because of whatever you want. But they wanted to become an important big power. So that thought, that idea that nuclear weapons might be developed in the country was certainly present. I doubt, I really doubt that a program, a state, a national program existed. But there were certainly people who thought of that. Now in the 70s and the 80s, <clears throat> and then later in the 90s, when Brazil finally acceded to the NPT, the outlook had changed. The idea was no longer that to become a great power, you needed to have nuclear weapons. What you needed to have was solutions to your internal problems of inequalities in the society, uh, poverty, lack of uh, uh, regional disparities, and things of that sort, which fortunately have been uh, being dealt with, I think, successfully by some of the, of the uh, recent administrations in Brazil. So I do not think uh, to a uh, quick answer is that uh, Brazil never abandoned the program because it never existed. But the idea that nuclear weapons would be beneficial to lifting the country to the status of great power, this, I think, has definitely been abandoned. And the people of Brazil are more secure in their lives because of that decision. Yeah, they ne I don't think they ever felt insecure in the in the sense of, of attack of, of uh, you know uh, threats from neighbors. The the so-called rivalry between Brazil and Argentina has been, in my view, very much overplayed, as if in the times of the of the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. There should be pairs of rival countries in every in every continent. Wow. <laughs> but that that is really not true, and the 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 uh, 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 the, the proof that this is, this was not the case in South America is that Brazil and Argentina chose a completely different path to to of cooperation in the in what they did in their in their now not only in the in the uh, nuclear weapon free zone but also in their bilateral. Uh, arrangements, so to, to, to allay completely any any uh, ideas that uh, there could have been, <coughs> there could be, on, or in the, f in the future, a, a, a nuclear race between the two countries. So I think that Brazilians felt insecure because of those aspects that I mentioned, because of poverty, because of inequality, because of poor poor uh, internal uh, enforcement of internal legislation, things of that sort. That's that that's what made people insecure not the, the idea of threat of attacks. Fortunately, Brazil has no enemies, and no one, no one looks at Brazil as an enemy. And I think this is a great, a great uh, uh, plus uh, for a country like Brazil. Sorry. OK, we're running a little late on time, but have time to entertain one more question. I saw you in the back. Yes? I have a question for Adam. 
will it make sense to bring India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea into the nuclear club to prevent further proliferation? Because these four countries, which are not part of the official nuclear club, they are and especially Pakistan, in case Pakistan, we know that they have been proliferated. So if they are not in the same group, so they could get further proliferation. Can start on the end with Mr. Mendelson. Oh, yes. Sure. I mean, I would certainly say that you know the the greater amount of inspections, the greater amount of transparency, <clears throat> is certainly going to help to limit the amount of um, proliferation that's going on. Uh, is it 100%, 100% verifiable or, or knowable about what's going on? Certainly not. But I think it's uh, a positive, a, a difficult positive. And uh, I think it's a confidence building measure for other countries as well. I mean, just to, to take the Middle East as an example, if you were to bring Israel in to the NPT and uh, have them accede somehow to having very thorough inspections of the facilities, that would be um, a step in the right direction in terms of uh, the overall situation in, in the region. Uh, I think it would be a huge problem to uh, to bring them in as if they came in as non-nuclear weapon states the way South Africa did. South Africa had nuclear weapons. It renounced them. It got rid of them. And it joined the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. There, th thus, the entire continent of Africa is a nuclear weapons free zone under the Treaty of Pelindabra. So that became very good. Um, if any of those states were to renounce nuclear weapons and join, that would be very good. But if they came in as nuclear weapon states with all of the privileges of that status, it would be rewarding very bad behavior. I think the, the, what I suggested in my speech earlier uh, was universalizing the norm against nuclear weapons. You know, nonproliferation is an interesting concept. It depends where you start your analysis. If you start your analysis in 1967, which is what the NPT does, then you have five states identified as nuclear weapon states, legitimately under the law. But I start my analysis in 1944, and the United States thus becomes the first proliferator then the Soviet Union, the second proliferator, and so forth. <clears throat> so I, I'm a strong proponent in non-proliferation, but going back to the standard of 1944, not to the standard of 1967. And to get there, we need to have a nuclear weapons convention that universally eliminates them. And that's the way to bring India in. And I might add, the Prime Minister of India, in supporting the Rajiv Gandhi proposal of 1988, which he did just last year, said that India supports a nuclear <coughs> weapons convention. And Pakistan has said that they will follow India in this regard. So if you bring India and Pakistan in, uh, and the norm, uh, the norm of, of disarmament is vouchsafed, I don't think Israel would stay out, would be the only country staying out of the regime, and certainly North Korea couldn't. So that, to me, is a better way. Like to comment? No, I, I agree completely with what Jonathan said on the uh, who, who were the proliferators and where, when it started. And I think that the NPT was an attempt to have the world believe that proliferation really started in 1970 when the treaty entered into force. And that's simply not true. And I hope that the, the original proliferators would uh, uh, understand that they uh, should do something about disarmament. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Now to present our closing remarks, I'm proud to introduce Professor of International Law here at Quinnipiac University, Professor Jeffrey Meyer. Thank you, and I, I know when to be brief, and it's very humbling to follow um, an Undersecretary General of the United Nations, a keynote speaker, and a diehard uh, UConn basketball uh, fan. <laughs> What if, what can, what should, I want to address briefly, very briefly, what was. Um, Jonathan Granoff, uh, Dr. Helfand, and John Burroughs, uh, they challenged us, they chilled us, and inspired us 
Uh, Jonathan uh, reminded us of the Hiroshima historical transformative moment that we don't think often enough of. We were challenged to think about nuclear weapons as not just weapons, but technopathogens that are off the human scale. We were also challenged to think more broadly than we conventionally do, than the media conventionally has us do, to think about the danger that comes not just from rogue states, but from ourselves. I think, as Jonathan Granoff put it most aptly, the oops factor, just from the sheer numerosity of uh, weapons that, uh, and technopathogens that we have at large in the world. Hans Christensen and Nick Roth uh, raised very elusive questions about the U.S. nuclear posture and our production capacity, which seem to be going in opposite directions from our avowals uh, to reduce the spread of nuclear weapons. A troubling two-sided coin. On the law, John Burroughs admonished us about remembering, about establishing more of a complete NPT institutional framework. He talked also about uh, remembering to uh, reinstills a notion of what is good faith under Article 6 of the NPT treatment. And probably the most effective, I thought, uh, demonstrative uh, exhibit of the day, instead of using a PowerPoint um, uh, presentation, he used oral effects of squealing tires, if you remember, outside the uh, <laughs> audience. He set that up uh, purposely uh, to make the point that we weren't getting anywhere on those very important uh, Article 6 uh, uh, commitments. Uh, Orde or Kitri and uh, Meha Shah, uh, who had to unfortunately leave us a little bit early to catch a train, uh, they brought us a bit back to earth and focused on uh, problems of lack of compliance, monitoring mechanisms, how to amend the NPT when it's almost legally impossible to do so, how do you amend it without amending it, and thinking about how can we use or how can the Security Council uh, act here with respect to uh, something such like preset sanctions and other uh, 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 repertory uh, regimes. On policy, Adam Mendelson uh, reminded us, if you remember when Bill Clinton won um, his uh, election, at some point I think it was George Stephanopoulos who said, or, George, or, or one of his other advisors said, it's the economy, stupid. Adam came here to remind us it's not the law, it's not the policy, it's the relationships. Right? And he painted a very complex picture of those relationships, reminding us that we were all going and want to go in the same direction, but that it can be extremely difficult, more than sometimes lawyers would like to admit. Jonathan Granoff and Ambassador Duarte uh, res uh, returned to a resounding call for us to return to the rule of law, to a new nuclear weapons convention, to redefine the way that we are thinking of nuclear security in a manner to think of it as non-nuclear security. So that is what was. Many answers to the basic direction we must, we must go, many remaining questions about how, how we get there. Great inspiration to be and to remain engaged and to proliferate our own outrage and concerns about this vital issue. Special thanks to our students, to the co-presidents of the International Human Rights Law Society, uh, uh, Danielle uh, Robinson and Darren Preslow, to the other students who are integrally involved with planning, in fact, running parts of this uh, conference, Tamar Sager, Alicia D'Souza Rocha, Rocha, Alex Kuehling, Kara Suma, Karen Donnelly, and Julia Shah. We wish you a very safe weekend, and thanks to Mark Schulman as well for uh, participating as our special moderator today, um, and safe Travel good speed. Take care.